So today we have Kodak Retina 3S rangefinder camera and actually I've got three of them here that need to be serviced. They're uh, of different ages and have different problems. So we'll just have a quick overview of these and show you what I've got here. This one here is the earliest of them and it has features that were not common to the later um, 3S cameras. So it's quite interesting to see the difference. Excuse me, probably the first noticeable difference here is the aperture scale. It only goes to f2.8. Most of the menu, most of the production, of course, went to f1.9, which means that when the 3S was first released, it was intended to be used with the f2.8 lens, which is uh, interesting in itself. Of course, most people tend to gravitate towards the f1.9 lens um, because we all like things to be run faster and hotter and all the rest of it. It's not very nice to use on 3S cameras. The problem is it's too wide and it actually blocks a lot of your view in the corner of your finder if you use the f1.9 lens. It was a later lens which was slimmer and that wasn't so much of a problem. However, let's have a look at this camera. What else can we see about it? Well, this as I say is an earlier example and let's just work right down. We've already touched on the aperture scale. The meter only goes to ASA 1300. Most of the production the meter runs out to 3200. The film reminder dial here is of the older type. It's the multiple type. So you've got reminder dial positions there for Kodachrome daylight and artificial light and pan, pan, what have we got here? pan X plus X and tri X coat of colour, ectochrome daylight, ectochrome and artificial light. So that um, gives you something to play with there. The direction arrow for your rewind is actually on this chrome piece in the centre of the dial. Anything else of note here? What have we got here? The meter setting wheel on the bottom of the camera there. Now the later cameras all have a black infill there, painted infill. This is just completely bare and chrome. The lens that's on this camera is not an original. It probably came from a Reflex 3, I would think. You can tell that because it's got the knurled edge at the front. It would originally have had a lens like this one. With a smooth edge on the front there, and it's got a little focusing tab on the side of it. What about the faults that this one has? What have we got here? I've made notes of this. Okay, so yeah, the leatherette. The leatherette's loose on the front panel here. Probably the other side as well it is. So the leatherettes are loose. Does that mean they've come loose naturally or someone's been poking and prodding at it? Well the leatherettes are relatively tidy on this, so either is a possibility. Um, it could be that the adhesive has given up because the original adhesive has given up, or it could be that it's been serviced and a, a more useless adhesive has been used and it's just peeled up at that spot. But the leatherettes are tidy, I don't see any problem in getting into that. What else? The rangefinder on this one was slightly out. It's got it's got a rattle. There's something loose inside there. We've got a, a loose screw, I think. The shutter speed settings on this are very stiff, but they do move. The aperture setting, yeah, that's pretty pretty awful. So there's certainly a problem in the settings there. And apart from that, well the shutter actually works reasonably well. I think that this one could potentially 
be used as it is with a great deal of difficulty because the dials are stiff or more ideally we would want to see if we can fix the minor problems that the camera obviously has uh, with a view to not having to give it major surgery. Of course this camera and its two mates are going to get completely stripped down in the fullness of time but it would be nice to perhaps demonstrate how you could get this back into a working state without having to strip it right down to the chassis. Here we have subject number two. Now this is a later camera. Oops, I could put the lens back on there properly I suppose. A later camera as such. The ASA scale here runs all the way to f1.9. The F4 mark on there is in red. Now the significance of the red F4 mark is that's where you are supposed to set your aperture to before interchanging lenses. And uh, what that does is it, it means you're not stressing out the meter cord and all the rest of it when you swap the lens on there if it's sitting in that position. This would have been probably its original lens. Uh, this one's been dropped. You can see that the front edge here of that lens is a bit pushed out of shape. I'm going to have to see if I can true that up somewhat. In that state it wouldn't take the bayonet mount lens hood. What else can we say about this camera? Well, these three screws holding the shoe in place are all incorrect. I don't know where they've come from. They've got no chrome plating on them. Hopefully they're not just self-tappers or something awful like that. Our meter settings button at the top here, the plastic window is cracked and uh, very likely that's getting ready to fall out. The top cover on this one is somewhat battered about. I would say, looking at that battering, those marks there, that this has been knocked off the top of the camera at some stage and someone has attempted to straighten up the top cover and get this fitted back in place. Now how successful they've been, we're not going to really know until we get this thing apart. Anything else of note? Well, as I say, being a later camera, it's got a simplified rewind knob with only three film reminder dial positions on there and the direction arrow to tell you which way to turn your rewind knob for those people who don't automatically know is engraved on the top cover that rewind knob comes up with great reluctance there on the top cover you can see that little arrow the leatherettes on this yeah they're pretty lumpy this camera has certainly been serviced before, probably on multiple occasions. You know that leatherette patch on the on the uh, focus the film advance lever there is certainly particularly rough. A couple of ice bumps on the back, and uh, a nicely engraved name and address on the top here for people who need to know. So that's quite interesting. It's been quite nicely done. It's quite nicely styled that. It's better than some of the social security numbers you see etched in the back with a blunt nail. Inside the camera, anything of note? Not an awful lot. You've got a piece of paper there with the number two on it in this case because I've labelled these ones so I can keep all their parts separate so that I can get everything back where it came from if I get excited and take all three cameras together to the same state all at once. But this one, what's its faults? Let's have a look. The leatherettes are lumpy, we've said that. that the rangefinder is slightly out. There's a few extra lines visible in the finder. Now in the bright lines for the, uh, the frames, basically they are clear spots on a black ground. Now if the black ground gets a scratch through it, you end up with more clear spots. And that's exactly what we've got somewhere in those in the frames for the uh, different focal lengths. There's clear spots showing and they need to be painted out. 
Anything else? Oh yes, the meter on this one. Well, I said that this it obviously had some damage and someone's obviously put that top back on there, judging by all these little crenellations around the edge. Well, it turns out that the meter is somewhat pushed out of shape, and as a result, the follower needle, needle catches the movement needle at the uh, light end of the scale. So that means that the meter is absolutely useless because you get down to about two-thirds of the way across the scale and the follower needle picks up the meter needle and drags it wherever it wants and so you can't get a good indication of what your light levels might actually be. It probably means that the meter dial on top of the meter underneath this top cover is, is bent down and so that the follower needle is bent down and catches on the movement needle. We'll find this stuff out. So that one there is, it's got its problems and the problems with the meter, they can be entertaining because it's difficult to do anything about something like that without removing the meter cord. And of course if you remove the meter cord, then you've pretty much got to pull the whole camera down to deal with it. So this one, it's possible that this could be sorted out without major surgery. It is actually possible to replace a meter without removing the cord in the front of the camera. I have done it before. It's very, very difficult. The success rate is, is, is not high. So this one, yeah, that could possibly be serviced and returned to a useful state without being completely stripped down, but it's not looking quite so hopeful. That was number two. So this one, number three. This one, this is a much better looking camera, it's nice and tidy, there's a few little zeiss bumps on the back of that leatherette, but the leatherette itself is otherwise quite good. It probably means that those bumps will come out quite well. I can't really see obvious signs that this has been serviced before, but I suspect it has. The leatherette on the base here is just curling up a bit at the edge. I can see a line along there, but I don't know whether that's because someone has attempted to peel the leatherette back slightly, or whether that's just normal, because that's where the casting stops either side, and the front plate comes in at that point. This one. Well, unfortunately for this one, the meter cord is broken, and the shutter doesn't fire. It doesn't release. You get a weak click sound, but nothing else is happening. What do I suspect has happened with that meter there? Well, the meter cord, they do just die. They will do that. But in my experience, more commonly, they've been murdered. So how do you go about murdering a meter cord? Well, one way you can do it is that you can decide that the front rings on your camera are unusually stiff and they're moderately stiff on this one, they're not as bad as the other two cameras. But if you take the front rings off to clean them and you haven't been exceptionally careful about where everything goes back, you end up in a situation where instead of the movement of all of this action being limited by the physical stop built into this, you reach the end of the meter cord before you reach the physical stops built into the controls. And that means that if you just give it one extra push to try and get the numbers to come round, you snap the cord. And I strongly suspect that that's what's happened in this case because you can't set the full range of shutter speeds and apertures. If I set that round to a 500th, and I start winding the aperture round, we only get to between f11 and f16 and the dial won't go any further. Which means that probably at the other end of the range it's reached the knot in the string and um, the string snapped. So this one is most definitely a camera that needs to be absolutely completely stripped down to the chassis before it could do anything useful at all. So I'll put that 
lens back on there and what I'm going to do with these three cameras is they're all, they're all neatly numbered and I've got containers for all three cameras so I can keep them separated and I can work my way through them so I think we'll start with camera number one so starting with camera number one this is the oldest of the three cameras I'm going to start by removing the lens and there's just the release button on the bottom of course just hold the release button and rotate the lens lift it out They're just a bonnet mount nothing tricky there I'll put that lens to one side because we don't need it immediately I don't know whether I mentioned earlier that the nameplate here is, has, as you'd said on the earlier examples you've only got the outline of the letters on the later cameras though they're just solid blacked out letters ok so with this camera what have we got to deal with with this let's remind myself well, the leatherette's loose well, well we can deal with that as and when we feel like it the RF's slightly loose and it's got an obvious rattle something's rattling around in the camera we're going to have to find that the shutter speeds and aperture speed settings are very very stiff I think we're going to start with that it may be possible to deal with that first of all though I don't like rattles let's open the top of the camera and see what we get so something through the fork of the rewind spin the rewind knob off complete with your fingers lift off that little bush or cover let's put that to one side and you can start removing things now yeah, bearing in mind that we're trying to resurrect this camera without major surgery it's important not to lose parts or damage anything that would mean we'd have to take the whole camera completely down it may well come to that but we'll, we'll try not to so we'll take that chrome screw off at the end there are two chrome screws on the top cover at the rewind end lift off the top cover carefully look underneath nothing obviously odd going on there that all looks pretty good take off the meter settings button and there's a little spring underneath that remove that be careful not to lose it otherwise you'll be hunting around for a uh, something to replace it now the shutter release button can come off but the rest shouldn't fall out the important thing here is not to have that meter lift up get disconnected because it will take the tension off the cord and if we take the tension off the cord well then you can be sure the cord will fall off the pulleys and that's the end of the world you can forget it so let's tip this upside down see if we can get our rattling screw to come out I think that we've got a loose screw un in, under the front here it probably means that one of the screws holding the shutter to the back of the front plate is loose I can't really feel any movement there there are four screws it's likely that one of them has, has fallen out it may have completely fallen out in which case wrapping the camera around it might might find its way out or what's also likely is that it's backed out as far as it physically can before it hits something else and so it's just rattling backwards and forwards in position so that rattle that's a bit annoying but uh, that's not the end of the world okay we haven't satisfied ourselves that we're not going to get the, the rattle out of that top of that camera I'll put this stuff back in and we'll have a go at sorting out the sticky front rings so I'll put the spring back on there I have to say this 
looks quite clean. Well, it look, actually, it, it's dirty, but it doesn't look like it's been serviced before. It's in quite good condition. This would have been one of the first few thousand cameras down the line, I would imagine. Certainly not the oldest one in the world. Alright, let's get that screw back in there. I don't know whether that video camera is capable of focusing quite that close without a bit of assistance. And I'll put the rewind knob back in place. And we'll attempt to clean up the front rings, and hopefully, that's where the stiffness is with the meter settings. Very hard to know sometimes. So, I'm going to start here by adjusting the film speed here by holding the button down, turning the wheel at the base of the camera to set that to ASA 10. Alright. I'll set my shutter speed to B. And I'll set my aperture to f2.8. Just checking to make sure that the film speed didn't move. That's all looking good. Now, as long as all the rings go back in place at those settings and that the coupling ring inside is in the correct place and we don't disturb anything, I should be able to remove the front rings, clean everything, put everything back and if the stiffness was in the front rings and we could dealt with it, we should have fixed the problem. It's possible that the stiffness isn't there at all, that it's in the meter chord drum and so forth, but we'll just have to find out. If it doesn't work, well the front's got to come off the camera. So there are three screws hold this in place. They're chrome plated brass, easily scratched, use a good screwdriver, don't slip. I've probably said that before. Now these three screws are identical, unlike on the uh, Reflex S where you would have a longer screw in one of the positions. Okay. I want to remove those rings complete now without disturbing the position of anything. And I'll put that down so that we can look at it. Now normally this little gap here, and I'll zoom you in so you can see that. So here are the front rings off the shutter, and all of these pieces need to be cleaned. The aperture ring here in particular is very stiff. I think that's where most of the stiffness in the systems come from. There's a little tab on that. It has to be lifted out, so you lift it off the other side, pull it out, and disconnect the connecting spring. And most likely it's just dust and grit that's trapped up around these edges. And old grease, of course. There's far too much grease in here. To clear all that away. 
and get these pieces working nicely. Then they can be reassembled and put back on the front of the camera and hopefully the aperture settings and shutter settings will work smoothly at that point. Before removing the front rings you need to set the exposure meter to ASA 10. You hold the button on the top It's set to ASA 10 now, I think. It's, it's good. Set the film the shutter speed to B. Rotate the wheel at the base of the camera clockwise as far as it goes with light pressure, and you'll see that your aperture lock mark right here goes beyond 2.8 so the 2.8 is actually in line with the one second mark so that's your start position we can take the rings off now and as long as we put everything back in the same place all will be good now while you're here because chances are you will disturb something because that's the nature of things take note of the angle of this meter dial in fact take a picture of it and the yellow pointer in the corner there which is your follower needle take great note of where that sits exactly because you want to get make sure that you put things back exactly where you found them and then hopefully things will go very smoothly so next trick removing the front rings so we've got three screws the screws were identical on this camera on the reflex s for example they're different one of them is different length And the front rings should be lifted off. They may come off as a group. They did. Okay. So these rings have all got to be cleaned and then they can be put back together. And hopefully that'll solve the problem with the stiff aperture. Let's take these apart. So we've got our shutter speed ring. This clever ring here with the little rotating gear on it. And here we have the aperture scale. Now this has got a spring on it. It's got a little tab which pokes through there. You have to lift it up, stretch it out slightly to disengage the tab. And at that stage the spring will probably come off the hook. And these components just need to be cleaned with some naphtha. To remove all traces of old grease and dust and dirt and you will probably find that there is ingrained dirt and filth in that fine groove at the edge there and you need to get all that out as well so I'll just clean these components up and I'll show you how to lubricate things and put them back together in the right place. The first thing to get back together is the aperture scale ring. This spring, which may or may not have come off its post here, needs to be in place. And we have to hook it onto that little hook there. Stretch it out slightly until the little tab drops into the slot and this should move smoothly. That's pretty good 
now that it's clean it was very stiff earlier but I'm going to lubricate that with a bit of graphite powder you could use uh, molybdenum powder if that's what you had I suggest you use a dry lubricant for this let's just pop a little bit of graphite into here I just want to work that backwards and forwards. We've got the contacting aluminium surfaces and if you know anything about aluminium it does make a wonderful bearing surface. And we've also got the spring in there which obviously rubs against the edge of that slightly. So Having moved, worked that in well, I'm going to blow that out now with the blower and then we can put the rest of it together. First thing to go back is the shutter speed settings room. And here you'll see this notch and this smooth piece here. Now that is where it disengages from the shutter speed settings when you turn it past the B position. This little notch, the square notch, has to couple against this spring here. This is sitting in the B position at the bottom of its movement. And you'll see that as, as you rotate this past the B position, it disengages. It's not moving anything, but as soon as it drops to the B position, it will move. This ring will move that tab and shift it backwards and forwards. It's only once you get to the park position here that the slope on that ring allows that spring to push past it. This piece, this goes in next. Often this is a bit sticky with grease, this one's pretty good. And I'm just going to run a soft lead pencil around these edges at the top here and then an inside edge just to give it a little bit of a film of graphite if you like to get this in the right position you can see there's a cut out here the wheel is over at this side, but there's a cutout. That cutout must come up against this post here, that pin. So we rotate this anti-clockwise so the edges of the cutout is against that post and drop it into place. Now this little wheel might not drop into place immediately, so you've got to move that so that it drops in. It has to engage with the notches here on that shutter speed setting ring. Let's bring that round against the pin. Click that into place. And that's all sitting there. So we've got the shutter speed set to B. We have the wheel in place. And this is set, sit, sitting at its rest position. And as you can see, its rest position, the F2.8, is not lined up with the red dot. The red dot lines up probably a stop over. In fact, it lines up exactly where F1.9 would be on the later cameras. And if we lower this into position, you may have to give it a bit of a wriggle, but it should drop into place. And what we're trying to do, let's put this back in. Now sometimes, yeah, this, this can be, it's a very neat fit on that ring. What you're trying to do is couple the teeth on this little wheel with the teeth here. 
this little cut out lines up with the pin that this ring is sitting up against. And the screw holes obviously line up. That's it. So that dropped into place. Check that your meter is sitting where you left it to start off with. It hasn't moved. Check that the rings are sitting level. That they did in fact seat. And assuming that they did, you may have to do this two or three times before you get it to go smoothly. Two the screws up. These screws are chrome brass and they mark very easily. So I'll get the three screws in position. Check, just run them down till they're just lightly done up. Check that things move, check that the shutter speed ring will move. And you should get a full range of motion there. This is in the B position when the shutter speed is set to B. It's going to, yeah, it's going to you find that it will rotate past those positions. Now with the meter setting wheel at the bottom of the camera, we'll rotate this. And we can rotate our shutter speed settings. And as you can probably tell, All this is working very smoothly indeed. So that's all good. With that working well, I can nip those three screws up. And that problem that we had with this camera, with the stiff front control rings, is that problem's gone completely and we've done it without having to do any major surgery so that's what you're hoping to achieve so points of interest with this well because this is an early example and as a result the focus the aperture scale only goes to f2.8 you'll notice that the f, when I turn that wheel all the way around there to the stop F2.8 lines up with the one second. Now if we bring in camera number two, which is the one you're more likely to strike, you'll see that in this case, the aperture scale goes to F1.9. And so when the turn that wheel as far as it will go in a clockwise direction at the base of the camera, it's at F1.9. 